Citizen Board. Our main speaker tonight is Max. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Max Parker and I'm an alcoholic. Very nice to be here and uh, I feel honored to be able to share myself with you and that's what I'm going to do in the next 30 minutes. Um, I want to thank Barbara Tunde for speaking. I love the heart coming out of him up here. Um, that's what this is about. And uh, Beth was phenomenal as well. I very much identified with like the delusion thinking and the, I, I like the boardroom. I identify with that. Um, I want to thank Heidi for asking me to speak. I love Heidi. Uh, I met Heidi here when I spoke here the first time. And she came up and grabbed me and sat me on the stage. And Heidi got sober about the same age I did. She was a little older. I think she was 16. Um, so, and I, then I got to hear Heidi. And I, I've never identified as much with somebody's story as hers. And I'm not saying that because she's gorgeous and blonde. <laughs> Maybe partly, but... Um, <laughs> But really, I, I mean, one of the things that we have in common, I'm not trying to embarrass Heidi, but I, I, I do love her and I love her energy. And in her story, she talks about something I talk about, which is that at the end of my drinking, and I will tell you my story. It's really exciting. Eighth grade is the best. Um, <laughs> at the end of my drinking, I was having delusions, literally. And, and I, I did so many hallucinations as well as all the drinking. And I do not dwell on drugs in my story because it's AA. Um, but because of all that, um, I thought I was Jim Morrison. I didn't like, I, 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 I didn't just like think I, I was Jim Morrison, you know? And to tell you what's happened in the last 28 years, 27 years, is uh, I jumped up a couple months. Um, I was in spin class the other day. I have spinning this morning. And Peace Frog's a great door song. And every time it comes on, my spin teacher's like, Max, I think of you when this song comes on. And then I yell out, that's because I wrote it, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and then nobody really gets it, because they're all just normal people getting up and spinning at 6 o'clock, you know? But I just wanted to tell that story. It's a true story. Um, <laughs> but I did. I, I got this, my, my, my home group is the Harbor Island group. My sobriety date is June 16, 1981. I uh, have a sponsor. His name's Clancy. He'll be speaking here in a couple weeks. And... Um, you know, I, 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 I don't, you know, I, I always say this when I speak, that I don't say the four most dangerous words in Alcoholics Anonymous, which is, I will qualify briefly. Because if I do say those words, at 25 minutes when she holds the thing up, I'm going to be in seventh grade, and you're all going to be, like, wanting to kill yourself. And uh, I was asked to speak down in Dallas when I was 12 years sober, and I asked how long I should speak for, and they said an hour. I'm like, I got sober at 15. And they're like, well, just tell the whole story. You know, like, really, just get it, you know, so I was like, and then in sixth grade, you know, and I looked at the clock, and there were like 10 minutes to go, and I was like, oh, my God. So I learned, you know, I, if I sit here and tell you this, it's, it's not good to anybody, and me either. Um, but I did, I am a real alcoholic. I drank very intensely. I am very lucky that I've never lived in the delusion that I, it was a phase that, I, you know, my mom was paranoid because I was 15 and throwing up all the time and blacking out and threw me in rehab and that's why I'm sober. When I was about 12 years sober, I had dinner with my cousin who is a very heavy drinker and she said that to me. She said, Max, wasn't it like your mom just freaked out because her dad died of alcoholism and then threw you in rehab and, you know, that alcoholic thinking, you know, that keen alcoholic mind was like, that's it. My mom was paranoid. I was, you know... I was at that point 12 years sober, and that's not it. I, um, I drank very heavily, and I, I earned my seat here as much as anybody. And the thing for me, and it doesn't matter if it happens to you, and I hope it does, I, I, I can't believe I'm sitting in front of somebody today that has one day. I mean, to me, to actually be able to say that is amazing, because I couldn't have said that. Um, I was thrown into a treatment center, so I really hope we all get to welcome the one-day person after the meeting, because... If you feel welcome here, in my opinion, you stay here. And when you want to use that as an excuse later, you'll leave. That's just my experience. But what happened to me, as my sponsor says, it happened very slowly what happened when I drank really fast. So I grew up in New York. I, my parents split when I was really young. I grew, out, I grew up an hour out of New York City. 
I was lucky enough to drive in tonight with a, a childhood friend of mine who is still a very close friend, and it's, it's a special relationship because he, he's sober 18 years, but it's, and that's a special thing. But we have a childhood friendship, and it's great. We drank together, and, and f- you know, Fred saw me drink, so if you want to ask him about my drink, you can ask him. Um, I got to experience his first blackout, which was a lot of fun, because um, then I didn't get to drink. But uh, I drank, I started, I, I got sober at 15, and I hear people's stories, and I started drinking at four. You know, maybe it was like the stuff on the gums, or that wasn't, that's not my story. I started drinking at 10, and I didn't start drinking, in my estimation, late. Uh, If I knew what drinking did to me at 8, I would have, because the way I felt on the inside. Um, And I didn't really start drinking until I was probably 12, you know. But as our book says, that because I was maladjusted to life, because I was full flight from reality, you know, that's not what makes me an alcoholic you know I I could have been a messed up kid which I was I was very maladjusted to life you know not dealing with things right you know I played baseball very good in fourth you know fifth grade they advanced me up to the next league I got hit too many times and quit so the way I dealt with that was not like go join basketball or soccer I joined girls softball because it seemed like a good idea at the time yeah um because I needed to be a star. You know, I was the fastest kid in my school. You know, yeah, I was. A, I got a trophy. <laughs> Max Parker, girl softball, 1973. Um, <laughs> went right up there with my swimming trophy. Yeah. Um, and swimming was one thing I did really well. Uh, I don't know if Lisa's here tonight, um, Lisa L., but we share that. We, so I was a very intense swimmer and very good. And, and thank, I mean, I had no principles in my life and I pray for the good and bad to be removed every day because I can't handle the good as well as the bad and that's I believe why it's there or you know it helps me to handle the good as well as the bad because I would get on the block I would look to the guy next to me and say why are you even here go home and I'd win the race and there was just so much humility pouring out of me and it was just sad it was because it was the only way I knew to feel good you know and this is pre-drinking all leading into the drinking and swimming and drinking are very, it's a very important thing because when I was 13, I made a decision to stop swimming, which is the one thing I got benefit out of, and drink. And I remember sitting on the curb, waiting for my friends to come home so we could get a couple six packs and drink. And funny enough, well, that's, I don't know if it's funny or not, that's my story, but I drank a lot of hard liquor early. Um, that's my preface. I had a lot of hard liquor in my house because my mom was living with an alcoholic and he wasn't an abusive alcoholic and he wasn't a crazy drunk alcoholic and he was never an alcoholic that I looked to and said, oh God, I can't be like this guy. He was actually the nicest guy in the world. And he took me around to bars and I hung out in bars and that has nothing to do with why I'm an alcoholic. So again, I was maladjusted life and I was a mess. But what happened to me is I picked up a drink on August something of uh, 1975 and what happened to me is what it talks about in the doctor's opinion an obsession took over my I, when I poured the alcohol into my body the allergic reaction happened to me we had three quarts of beer and you know when a quart's not enough when you're 10 there's a problem and <laughs> that's what happened and then you know I could kiss a girl and it let me do things that I wanted to do because I couldn't have done them without it and that's how it started and then I drink here and there I drink at my friend's house because he was Italian and they drink wine and I got to drink there yeah, they pour you big glasses of wine because that's what they did and their kids never drank it, but I did. <laughs> they didn't, then they didn't let me over anymore. But, um, so that was, that was my drinking and, and I just went on and I, I did get into junior high and, um, and then I, it, it started progressing. In my junior high school, they gave, you, they, they, they gave an alcohol test of 20 questions um, that if you've been through a treatment center, or you, if you, don't, you know about it. And I, and I took it. And it was easy for me to pass because they were like, do you drink before work? You know, I was like, no. You know, do you drink and drive? No. <laughs> and, uh, and I was drinking at the time. And this girl, Amy R., Amy Reynolds, who, you know, she's, uh, she's like, you're an alcoholic. I know you are. And I'm sitting there drinking vodka and grape juice or something. You know? I drank. And I had the alcohol in the locker. If you've ever seen a you know, bad after-school special, that was me. Alcohol was in the locker, and I you know, drank. Big thing about my drinking is I was a big chameleon, 
What happened to me through, especially as my drinking progressed, is I could hang out with any group. It's like I could hang out with the deadheads. I could hang out with the jocks. I could hang out with, because I really was a jock. And then I became a frock, which is a freak who was a jock. And then by, <laughs> that's a good thing for Northern Westchester. And then, uh, and then I became a total freak. But, and I didn't plan on that, because I, I didn't want, deep down, I didn't want that. But seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, I was kicked out of school each year, and it was de directly because of drinking. You know, when a kid got sliced in the arm because of a knife, and I was involved with it, because I was drinking that morning, and I had drunk the night before at my house, and we had a party, and I had bought a lock knife, and then we ended up deciding to, you know, try to fight this kid and slice his arm. The cops are yelling at me <clears throat> how serious this is. I could care less because we're having a party that night that has a big keg and, you know, a whole bunch of alcohol. So it, the fact that I might have hurt somebody and, and all this stuff, this didn't even come into my mind. And so the chameleon thing, it was like I could hang out with this person, I could hang out, you know, and I got to watch that in AA. You know, because I could tell, you know, a certain story here. I could tell a certain story there. You know, if I'm speaking in New York City, I might mention that I drank in Europe, which I did, you know, because they like that. You know, it's like when I drank in Paris, you know, and, and then they say, I drank in Paris, and it's a good identification. Or if I'm just speaking out in Westchester, I might dwell on the drinking in the woods or whatever. <laughs> uh, if I'm speaking at the Atlantic Group, I might mention page 52 about the Bedevilment, it's just to impress you, you know. Uh, the fact that I read this and study it and, and take people through it. Um, but truth is, I, what's happened in Alcoholics Anonymous is I've become myself. And the best thing about it is it doesn't matter where I am, I'm the same person. And it's, it took me a long time, and I'll get into this a little later, but thanks to the 12th step, I actually became, the same, you know, one person. I don't think that takes, an, you know, a, a couple weeks or a year. I think, you know, it's... It's a nice thing to happen when you're here, but it takes some work, and it takes work going through the book, taking the 12 steps, working with a sponsor, and doing all the things we do. So what happened was it, the trouble kept happening, and my mom sent me away to boarding school, and at boarding school, things just got really out of hand, and <clears throat> I don't know why they knew I had a problem with drinking when I put all these bottles of alcohol on the wall, um, and two weeks into boarding school, they're like, you have a problem with drinking, and we're going to catch you drinking, and... And it seemed like boarding school was just trying to get through boarding school, not getting caught drinking. You know, that's, that was the goal. I made it until the day before the last day of school, which kind of seemed to be my thing. It was like I drank all the time, did a lot of other stuff. And the day before the last day of school, I'm walking with a six pack and the guy catches me. That was two weeks prior to me getting sober. The next day I'm walking around Boston train station, asking people that look like my parents if they'll buy my watch so I can drink because I couldn't take the Amtrak from Boston to New York without drinking. It had gotten to that. I'd walk up to total, that's how I was. I, I didn't have any shame. I drank in New York City a lot. My dad worked downtown off 36th Street and I'd meet some guy in McDonald's while I'm waiting for him and then we'd party, you know, because I just met him and he asked me for matches. I knew what he wanted. He didn't ask me for a lighter <laughs> or a light. Um, and then I'd walk in my dad's office, you know, blotto, and, and then, you know, I'd be like, where's the candy machine, you know? And it was just like that. It was just, wherever I was, I did my thing. And I did drink in Europe. My mom took me to Europe, and I was with my mom and my grandmother. And, you know, I supposedly couldn't drink for two weeks. After six days, I was about to scream. And to me, this is what alcoholism is. It's not the fact that when I started drinking, which I did, I couldn't stop. For me, about the second and a half beer, it seemed to kick off, you know? And I, and I always wanted to stop it, too. Because when I was about 14, I'm like, when I start drinking, I, you know, I get out of hand, so I'm going to have a couple beers tonight. I'm going to hang out, have some fun, have some laughs, you know? Be like every other kid and just, like, goof off. It, it wasn't like that. After the second or third beer, I just kept drinking. And then I started saying things I shouldn't say. And then I'd wake up after a blackout, and people wanted to kill me. That <laughs> seemed to be the case a lot. Um, just a lot of terror because of things I did when I was drinking. So six days into being in Europe, I was insane. So I'd run back to my mom's room and drink all the wine that she has and then get into a big fight with her in con and run away from her, <laughs> drunk. And I'd never been to Europe, never been to con. I'm 14 and I'm drunk and I wake up and I don't know where I am. 
And it was just that kind of things that happen all the time. You know, I'd wake up, I'm like, where am I? And people, they don't even speak English, you know? And I don't speak any French. Um, so it was just stuff like that was just going on all the time. So I'm walking around Boston train station, that whole thing. I'm sitting on my dad's porch because I, I can't even stand being around my mother. I'm drinking a vodka and orange juice because it just kind of got to the point where I'd wake up, drink vodka and orange juice, uh, listen to Dad, do, do all the stuff I was doing. And uh, all my friends were still in school because boarding schools get out early. And my mom told me I had to come down to Baton Rouge, to uh, Louisiana, because my stepfather had, uh, had, was in the tugboat business, and she lied to me to get me down to Louisiana. And to make a long story short, the day before I get down to Louisiana, she buys me some beer and says, Max, on June 16th, you're going into a treatment center uh, for kids who have dr drug and alcohol problems. And part of me was disgusted and hated her, and part of me was like so grateful that she was gonna, maybe, maybe there was gonna be something to it, and maybe not. And I didn't really know, I figured, because dishonesty was such a big part of my disease, I figured I could go into this place, lie, like I always lied, and just get out. And I remember walking into the treatment center, and there's this guy on the second floor, and he's wearing pajamas, he's smoking a cigarette, and, I'm think, and I got a very cool outfit on with two deadhead stickers on my pants, my Grateful Dead stuff, my hair's long, I'm weighing about 140. And I'm like, that poor sap. Look at him. God, that stinks. The guy's in a hospital. He's smoking a cigarette, right? Now, 15 minutes later, I'm sitting there smoking a cigarette in pajamas. Like, you know, Mom, where are you going? You know, sh and they locked the doors. And it was a very good treatment center. I was supposed to be in there for seven days. And this is for the one-day person. And I don't know if she's heard anything I said tonight or anybody else who said they were counting days tonight. But I heard a story when I was six days sober from a guy who had 58 days sober, and it blew my mind. I didn't understand how somebody could be 58 days sober. Why would you want to be 58 days? And he was all fired up. He, was, he had done the first five steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he was charged up. And uh, that's how, you know, it says so clearly in our book that self-knowledge avails us nothing. It's a point we want to emphasize and re-emphasize. And it's something I always talk about when I speak, because knowing I'm an alcoholic is not what got me sober. What got me sober was, you know, communication with other alcoholics and practicing all of the steps. Just the identification alone wasn't enough, you know, because I got that camaraderie feeling, but as it says very clearly, and there's a solution, it's not enough. I needed more. I needed a solution, a power greater than myself. And this treatment center did that. They you did the first five steps through the book. That's all you did. And then the I was 15 when I still left the place, so their thing was, he's not, he's 15, he'll drink again. And I went to a halfway house where you got a home group, you got a sponsor, you know, you did everything you're supposed to do. And that, and that was their whole goal in, in helping me. And I did the steps and I, you know, I, I went to meetings, I got a sponsor, and uh, it was very powerful. The man who took me to my first meeting killed himself three months later. And he was about three or four years sober. And when you're really new, a guy who's three or four sober seems like he's sober forever. And I only bring that up. I bring it up, I don't always say it when I speak, but I think it's important for new people. The reason we found out that that happened is because he had secrets. He had some serious, you know, sex secrets and financial secrets. And it, that was why that happened. And, you know, it was a good thing to learn while I was on my sixth and seventh step. Because if I have secrets and I'm sober... That might happen to me sober. I can get really messed up sober if I'm not practicing these steps. You just don't, you know, my sponsor told me when I was down there, he looked at this guy, he said, see that guy? He's been sober for five years in the first three steps. He loves meetings, he goes to meetings. He said, you can have that or you can do it all. And I was very lucky because in Baton Rouge, they were very step oriented. There were a lot of crawfish balls, you know, they boiled, whatever they call them. There were like 200 people would get together. You know, and it was a lot of fellowship. It was a lot like the Pacific Group in a way. There was a lot of fellowship and a lot of steps. So it wasn't just, it wasn't just meetings and really good steps, and it wasn't just fellowship where you could survive on the fellowship. But that happened to a lot of people. My home group down there, a lot of people would try to survive on the fellowship. It doesn't work. And then I, after my first year, I moved up to New York, and I joined the Mamaronic Group. And that was, you know, a great experience because I, they were very group-oriented. They had a big sign that said the world-famous Mamaronic group. 
And just like the energy in this group, uh, you guys know what it's like. It, it was very energetic. Ray O'Keefe was a member of that group, and he ran the group, and it was awesome. And there were, we had group anniversaries, and I was taught to shake people's hands after the meeting when they spoke. I was, sh I was taught to not speak on a step if I haven't done it. And I was taught also a lot of fun because there were a lot of funny things shared, and it seemed like the more deep somebody was sharing, the laugher we were laughing. It's like the worse the story is, the louder we're laughing, you know? And that's what I love about Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was taken to the steps. And um, I was taken all the way through the 12 steps. And I, I share this for an important reason, too. When I was 17, I, I got my first sponsee. And our book's very clear that we shouldn't, we got to be careful when we 12 step. Because the 12 step, we have a spiritual awakening, and then we carry this message to the alcoholic, right? This is the message we carry, a spiritual awakening. And I can tend to overmanage. And when I was 17, 18 years old, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to overmanage people's lives when I started to sponsor them. And when they'd call me up and say, Max, I'm having a hard time at work, I'd be like, so quit, you know? Like, what the, f <laughs> you know? I, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, they'd be like, you know, my wife's really annoying me. I'm like, leave her, you know? We're <laughs> supposed to be at meetings anyway. You know? uh, and that's like that like, excitement AA, you know? It's like, you don't care. I'd go up to a guy like Barbara Tunde's size and be like, sit down, shut up. You're like, yeah. I'm like, fight. I hope, I didn't say it to you. Um, but that was the kind of energy I had. I didn't care. Okay? I was so fired up with this. But that's what happens. I believe, as our 12 and 12, the energy that's released when you do all 12 steps. It's just not like the first three. And um, it, it's so tempting me for me to talk about so many... St I've been sober for, for 27 years. It's been more than half my life. And it's, it's, it's been exciting. And um, we, we had a 12-step meeting the other night. And it's my experience. I've been through all kinds of stuff in sobriety. I've graduated high school. I've graduated college. I've you know, tried to be an actor. I've, I've done all kinds of things and adversity and, and not adversity. But through everything that I've been through, financial problems when I was 12 years sober, and that's embarrassing when you're 12 years sober and you got financial problems. Because you got guys pulling up to your house in Mercedes asking about the third step. And you're saying, well, just go to meetings, you know, whatever. So I had to get honest about, about what was going on and deal with it and do what I needed to do about it. Um, so, but it's all on page 116 of the 12 and 12, it says that when we develop still more, the best source of emotional stability is to be God himself. And my experience is that no matter what's going on, if it's financial, if it's in my home life, or if it's you know, at work or whatever, it's more spiritual growth. And we don't practice these principles perfectly, but we have spiritual progress, not perfection, and I do it. But I do it. So I got into a relationship at four or five years, and it took over my life. And I had been sober, and I had been sponsoring guys, but it got in the way of that too. And then I had a little breakdown between my fifth and sixth year because it became my higher power. And I don't, I'm sure nobody can relate to this, but uh, <laughs> that's what happened to me. And then a very powerful thing happened for me because the Harbor Island group was formed, and uh, that was in 1987. And I got to, she stayed in the Mamaroneck group, and I got to join the Harbor Island group, and I got to become the GSR for that group. And I got to go to become a DCM. And I got to go all over the five boroughs and do all kinds of good, near, you know, exciting stuff. We had a committee that started the first Joe and Charlie seminar that was at Marymount College in 1988. And that was kind of changed my life. You know, and then I became an expert on the book. <laughs> and I told everybody about the book. <laughs> and they love that. Um, because I think this is really important. But I believe the experience... I don't say it's more important, but I, I do, in a way. I mean, I think, I think at some point you have to get what's in here, as Bob talks about in the story. You know, if you don't, he feels sorry for you. But it's not an intellectual uh, process. It's why I love Clancy so much. Clancy will be the first one to tell you that between, from the time he leaves here and gets to that coffee pot, he can be a mess. I love that, you know, and he's 50 years sober, and we talk every week. And my sponsor, Pete, who's in Westchester, who I've had since I had two years of sobriety, we talk every week. He's like my best friend. And, and 
it's, it's a, he's the guy I work through the steps with and I still talk to and knows when I'm, he sees me every week, knows what's going on, can point stuff out to me. So when that happened at between five and six years, I took the third step like I had never taken it before. You know? I started seeing things in the book that I had never seen before. You know, they talk about defiance being the outstanding characteristic of the alcoholic. You know, um, you know, the seven-step prayer took on a totally new meaning. Pete had been trying to tell me for years that the whole point of that prayer is that we're supposed to be of use to, to God and the people in our lives. And intellectually, I kind of understood it, but I really didn't get it. You know, until I went on a date, and we had a really nice time, I thought, and I worked out with this girl's brother. And the next day, I'm like, so Matt, did she have a good time? He's like, yeah, but she said you talked about yourself a lot. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, maybe that's what Pete's talking about. <laughs> and uh, that's the seventh step. And then I kept going in my acting, but the service is what saved me through this whole thing, doing tradition work, doing step work. I started sponsoring people differently. I didn't try to overmanage. I just started sharing myself. And um, 10 years sober, I moved into the city, really went after the acting. You know, I had a couple of fun things that happened, but nothing happened. It's a, you know, but I got to meet Frank M., who is the archivist of the World Service Office. And I got to have him in my life for three or four years and got to do big book studies with him and learn more about the traditions than... I ever wanted to know. <laughs> and uh, I'm not supposed, to, I don't want to, I don't get into tradition talks when I tell my story much because then it's, then it's like dry sandpaper when like somebody's telling their story. You know, it's like then the DCM and, you know, and the branches of service and, you know, it's like talking about the concepts. But, but if what Frank did for me with the traditions is he said, Max, when you make them personal into your life, they're very powerful. I met my wife when I was 14 years sober. I could not have met my, my wife and had the relationship we have today if it wasn't for the traditions. I work all 12 traditions with my wife. We can't be in the relationship if we don't have a desire to be in it. The power in our marriage is, is God in the second tradition, and we have to want to be in the relationship, which is the first tradition. And the only way to have unity is to you know, be in it. And if you go through them, it's very powerful. And I work it. We're self-supporting through our own contributions. So Frank really helped me with that. We would sit and pray. We would read. Emmett Fox and sit quietly. He taught me to do that. I, I don't sit quiet very well, uh, but I, I do it every day. I get on my knees every morning and every night. I have n probably missed four days in the last 27 years, and that's because my kid was crying with diapers or something, and I had to go to the hospital. I don't miss it. The foundation I got when I was early in sobriety has kept me to this time. If you're in your first year, please understand how powerful a foundation is, okay? It takes twice as long to build the Empire State Building as it does to build the foundation. And you, you cannot, when you're getting told to come early, meet your sponsor, read the book, do whatever you're being asked to do, it's because they love you. We're not here to break down anybody's ego. I'm not. I'm here to help somebody. You can't help anybody who doesn't want your help. That's the problem. You know, now this group was formed... And thanks to this group, I have Clancy. Because I started to get to know Clancy back in 93, 4. And uh, better. I had always known Clancy since, I was, since 1982. I heard him in 1982. I was, you know, 16 at a first conference down in Louisiana. And I was laughing my butt off, you know. And it was a phenomenal. And I, I luckily sponsor a man in this group named Vince, who it's the biggest joy in my life. And that wouldn't have happened if you guys didn't form. You know, he asked me a couple years ago, and it's been phenomenal for me because my AA doesn't consist of one kind of three-block radius. It consists of, I sponsor guys up in Connecticut that aren't my home group, you know, Vince and a couple other people down in the city, and it, it's, it's the joy of my life. The pure, what it says on page 89 of our book, that to watch people recover, to watch their lives change, that is the great excitement for me in my life. And so I married my wife. We had two amazing children. And now I'm going to end with this. As my child, nine years old, down in Florida, we just went down to Disney World. And i just got to tell you, if you go to Disney World, you need all 12 steps. <laughs> Don't go there unless you're really sober. But I'm having a really good... Because you want to punch Mickey right in the face at some point. But I'm having this talk with my daughter about God. And this is it. This sums it all up for me. 
is I'm on the bus with my daughter and we're talking about God and I'm talking to her that, you know, I said, Riley, it doesn't matter what's going on on the outside. It has everything to do with on the inside. And my daughter turned to me. She says, you know, Dad, I feel like I've had a pretty smooth life so far. You know, I said, and that's it. She's also the same daughter. When I asked her why, I said, Riley, do you know why I'm going out to Clancy's anniversary? She said, no, I don't know. I said, because he hasn't had a drink for 50 years. I said this to her. We're having lunch together. She looked at me dead serious, and she said, is he really thirsty? (laughs) And and, and that's it. So we have fun here. Debbie, I'm so glad you came, and uh, it's great to be here. Thank you.